if, my, if I may say so, and also uh, the US and the first world are taking sides, uh, and uh, nobody really knows how this is going to pan out finally. So my first question to Krishnan uh, would be, how do you really see it? Is this really a third world war by proxy? And when do you think this is going to end? What will it entail? for Ukraine, for Kabul, and the rest of the world? Uh, well, firstly, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for coming. And uh, a couple of days ago, I was talking about uh, detective stories. And today, I'm speaking about uh, world politics. Well, that's the Calcutta Literary Festival. And uh, my thanks to Malavika Banerjee for asking me to come. And she's an exceptional person. She's the only person I know who can be in three places at the same time. But anyway, coming to the question, which, you know, it's a hugely complicated situation. And um, the moderator has asked a hugely complicated, many-tiered question. So I'd like to break this up into small parts. I mean, the first part is regarding, is this going to be the Third World War? My answer to that would be no. I mean, if there are people talking about it, obviously they're great pessimists. The reason why I say no is at the moment, if, if, uh, um, if uh, Paroma is speaking about uh, Ukraine, I think the conflict is limited. Although it has very wide ramifications, it's geographically limited. I don't think any uh, sensible person, even none of the combatants, want uh, that geographical um, parameter of the conflict to be expanded. And I can, cannot see um, the use of uh, weapons in that area, which is going to lead to a much wider conflagration. Of course, nobody can tell what the future brings. But as of now, I don't see the possibility of a third world war at all. Would you like to uh, ask I'd like any? to ask <laughs> Nicola as to what he thinks. Well, yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming, uh, so many of you. <laughs> I think, yeah, I don't think there's a third world war yet. I mean, if I think like a comics book artist and I wanted to make some uh, science fiction book for third world war to happen, we should involve China. So if that's very hypothetical. If China is helping Russia by giving weapons, and if China take over Taiwan, for instance, maybe we would have a third world war, but I hope it's not going to happen. And even though the West is unified, which is very unique because Europe used to be divided, like uh, now they're unified and they're re rearming again, they're building weapons, uh, but there's most of the other countries are neutral, like India is not, uh, I don't think it's involved in that war at all, China not for the moment, so yeah, I hope it will end soon. And, uh, yeah. So on the tail of that, let me ask you that you just say the West is unified and, and led by the US. So how do you see this? Uh, is it really that, you know, it's a big nation trying to get smaller nations to do as they please? Or um, is it really US intervention in both Afghanistan and Russia? Where do you think the US is coming from and what role it is going to play in the country? Uh, actually, in Europe, there is uh, the Eastern countries, such as Poland, for instance, is very involved because they have uh, bad memories of, uh, of World War II and the Soviet period, they didn't like it at all. So now they're a key country to help, like uh, welcoming uh, Ukrainian refugees and bringing weapons to people fighting in Ukraine. So Eastern countries are very, they're very scared of Russia. Like France and Germany, they still believed until last month of diplomacy, and because Germany needs oil and uh, gas from Russia, like France, so they wanted to cool down and just like win over diplomacy. But as for America. I think uh, it's a good question. I don't think they wanted, I think Krishnan will know better than me, but <laughs> I don't think they really wanted to have that war. They wanted to focus on Pacific, you know, with uh, ACUS, with agreement with India. And, uh, they didn't want to go back to Europe, but no, they're here, and uh, I don't know. Okay. Krishnan? I think, um, you know, you, you were speaking both of Afghanistan and Ukraine. 
and uh, the American role. I think the role was, um, roles have been extremely different and over a different time period. You know, the Americans first supported the Taliban very strongly, or let us say the Mujahideen very strongly, for 10 years from 1979 to 1989. Uh, they flooded Afghanistan with weapons and enormous amounts of money. And then eventually, um, when the Taliban came into power in 1996 uh, till 2001, uh, there was a very uneasy relationship between the Taliban in Kabul and the United States for obvious reasons, because the Taliban represented everything which liberal democracies did not represent. So um, this, although the Americans had almost directly spawned the Taliban, they had great misgivings about them. And eventually when 9-11 took place, they used that as a reason to come to physically into Afghanistan, where they remained till 2021, that is 20 years. And they came in uh, in order to find um, and eliminate uh, Osama bin Laden. And of course, eventually they found he wasn't there at all. He was in Pakistan. He'd been spirited off to Pakistan by the Pakistanis. And um, there was not a single Afghan involved actually in 9-11. So the whole um, rationale, let us say, for the intervention in Afghanistan really was not valid. And uh, the result of this is, I think, that um, you have had about uh, 200,000 deaths in Afghanistan um, over that period, an unbelievably large number. And uh, two and a half thousand Americans also lost their lives. And eventually, of course, they had, the Americans had to negotiate with the Taliban for two years before the Taliban came into power again, which is the situation we have today. In Ukraine, it's entirely different. The Americans are not directly involved, though they are indirectly involved in numerous respects by, again, the supply of weapons in very large numbers uh, to the Ukrainian authorities, the supply of money, um, and um, I think that it's an open secret that there are many people fighting in Ukraine from the Western side who are not Ukrainians. There are British people, there are other European people, some uh, overseas Ukrainians have come back to join in the fight, etc. So to that extent, um, the Americans have found plenty of proxies, if you like, to contest uh, the Russian invasion. Because the Russian invasion, let's call it for what it is, it is in fact an invasion by Russia of an independent and sovereign country. Okay. Uh, yes, actually it was interesting here when the Americans were uh, giving weapons to the Mujahideen and the Taliban in the 80s, it was because they were fighting against USSR. So it was already a proxy war. So USSR spent like 10 years in Afghanistan and uh, they were defeated because uh, like, uh, they were given weapons by um, America and England, especially the Stinger, like the anti um, helicopter uh, missiles that really uh, change uh, the game on the country. And a, slight, once, a slight difference here, that yeah. uh, the Russians, or the USSR as it then was, they were actually invited to Afghanistan by the then authorities there. Right. So uh, they did not unilaterally intervene. It was the, it's quite different from the Ukrainian situation in that respect. Yes, you're right. But the, the way they are helping people to fight against Russia uh, is quite similar in a sense. But once the uh, USSR withdrew from Afghanistan, America, I think they care less about Afghanistan. It become a forgotten country. And when Taliban took power, nobody will talk about what happened so much. Maybe some magazines in the French newspaper sometimes. Or in France, we knew about Massoud, the, the man uh, who resisted against both the communists and the Taliban, he was very famous in France, for instance. But uh, before 9-11, nobody in America would, knew, would know about Afghanistan. Like The population wouldn't know how to place it on a map. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, and then what? <laughs> Ukraine. <laughs> 
Let me just rephrase it also and just focus a little bit on Russia's role. The, the large, the big public perception is that, yes, this is one large country is basically invading a smaller country, acting like a really big bully, trying to dictate the agenda, trying to break it down, and for them to surrender, surrender in an unqualified fashion. Uh, my question is that, that, yes, sure, partly this is true, but big nations tend to act sometimes as big bullies, as you know. Uh, not in such a direct fashion always, but there are sanctions, there are uh, you know, many other interventions that a bigger nation can, can impose to bring a smaller nation onto a platform or an opinion or a situation uh, that they desire. Uh, I was having a chat with Krishnan before, and she was, he was saying that nine billion Afghan dollars are, are actually stuck in the US, and they have not released those funds. And whereas, interestingly, US has already spent about two billion in Ukraine, and it is going to spend even more. So I just find it interesting that in different ways, the large nations can often and are, do act like bullies, even though Russia is primarily being seen as the aggressor here. So what do you think of that? Well, again, this is a very multi-layered question. Uh, the, the Russian Federation actually is not, uh, in fact, um, focusing on Ukraine as a specific country here. Uh, the Russians have nine neighbors, out of these nine neighbors, six are distinctly hostile, and they are members of an organization called NATO, NATO. which, whose own raison d'etre, the reason for being, is to oppose and confront Russia. It says it's a defensive organization, but it has crept all the way around Russia. Out of these nine country, uh, countries around Russia, one is sympathetic, that's Belarus, and two are, you could say, ambiguous. So they've got six countries around their perimeter which are distinctly uh, antagonistic. Now, this causes Russia to have security considerations foremost in their thinking. So when they consider Ukraine as possibly being the seventh country to join NATO, they're extremely alarmed because Ukraine is basically a flat plain and Russia has been invaded at least three times uh, across uh, the plains of Ukraine. There are two other considerations here. One is that there are many Russian-speaking people in Ukraine. And uh, the, the Russian Federation, rightly or wrongly, uh, they consider it a part of their mission to protect the Russian ethnic, Russian language, and Russian church people. So um, they have some legitimate interests in Ukraine, which they want to see protected. So the reason for going into Ukraine is not Ukraine as such, it is NATO. And this large organization, of which the United States is the undoubted leader and main weapon supplier, is also involved, though, of course, uh, as we say earlier, by proxy. But it is very much involved. And I think that the Russians have gone into Ukraine, I, I think by mistake, I mean, as an error, that is to say. It was a mistake, a very serious mistake indeed. Uh, but I think that the entire solution, if there is one, and we always hope that there will be one quickly, will not be Ukraine and Russia. It will be Ukraine, NATO, led okay. by the United States and Russia. So there'll be a lot of people involved in making a solution to this conflict when the solution arises. I think I'll leave it there for the time being. Uh, yeah. What do you think, Nicholas? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Christian is right. But also, from what I understand, because um, Ukraine is between two worlds, so it's some kind of buffer state, as Russia and EU uh, is surrounded by two different worlds. And it seems to me that the population they would prefer to have a European uh, lifestyle. When they are looking towards the West, they, they prefer to live in a democracy and to have like, more freedom and less corruption. So there's, uh, 
if that happens, I don't think it will nowadays, but if uh, Ukraine becomes a member of the EU, for instance, there is a scare for Russia that Russian will look at Ukraine and would like to have the same model for themselves. So it will be a threat for all the oligarchs and Putin. So for that reason, uh, Russia needs to have like some kind of buffer states between EU and themselves, a place where uh, that wouldn't be too much uh, NATO or EU. Um. Do you think that there's going, going to be a split between Western Ukraine and Ukraine splitting up between Western and Eastern Ukraine? Sorry? Is Ukraine going to split into uh, Western and Eastern Ukraine for precisely the reason that you're talking about? Uh, maybe. There is already Crimea, which is a part of Russia, yes. and Donbass maybe will join. But what's interesting, like the city of uh, Kherson, which is a Russian-speaking city, yeah. Uh, people didn't welcome the Russian army very well. They didn't want the Russian to come. Even though they are Russian speakers, you would think they will uh, embrace uh, being Russian, but it's not happening in that city. But I don't know about the other one, uh, about Donbass. I don't have any news. Do you think that can happen, Christian? Yes, I, I think that uh, that's an important point as far as Russia is concerned. Uh, I don't want to um, spread this discussion into other geographical areas, but uh, Russia has uh, actually uh, declared two uh, parts of Georgia, uh, which is also on the Black Sea, independent for much the same reasons that they have declared two parts of Ukraine independent. That is to say a Russian majority, Russian language speaking majority in those areas and uh, Russian Orthodox Church. And they claim, the Russians claim that th this minority had been oppressed by the Georgian government. This is the same argument used in Ukraine. They say that the Russian-speaking people in the eastern part of Ukraine, that is Donbass, as uh, my friend Nikola has said, it's a shorthand for uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, which are two provinces of uh, Ukraine. They claim that those um, minority Russian-speaking, Russian church populations are being oppressed and victimized. Uh, the, you know, there's a lot of doublespeak and hypocrisy in all this, and to say nothing of fake news, so one has to really cut through all this to get at the heart of the matter. When the Russians invaded, you would have thought the first thing they would do was to liberate, quote-unquote, uh, the Donbass, that is the Russian-speaking area. The odd thing is that they have entered Ukraine from the north, they have taken large parts of the south also, but Donbass has not actually completely been quote-unquote liberated. So the, uh, the Russian army hasn't concentrated on liberating the Russian-speaking people first, which is what you would have expected based on the arguments of the Russians themselves. So um, there's another contradiction also. Uh, the Russian uh, military has definitely underperformed. Uh, maybe this is a problem of logistics, maybe problem of, uh, of uh, tactics, um, of strategy, of leadership, who knows. But the fact is that they grossly underperformed and they've been um, outside the capital, Kiev. Um, I'll call it by the English name, Kiev. Kiev. And uh, for, for three weeks now, for four weeks now, and they haven't moved apparently very far to taking the capital itself. They haven't ever moved towards Odessa, which is the main port in, in Ukraine. So the, all these things are puzzling and big question marks. But I think there's another issue also which has to be considered. When the Russians moved 150,000 troops to the borders of Ukraine, then I think that the, uh, the NATO, the, led by the United States and France, Germany, many other countries, were more than ready to talk to Mr. Putin about his security concerns. There were many visits to Moscow, as some of you who followed this would know, and they've all had talks with Putin, either directly or on the telephone. It seemed to me, in the middle of February, that the Russians were getting quite a lot of what they wanted um, through these negotiations. So why the Russians, on the 24th of February, chose actually to move those 150,000 troops into Ukraine is a complete mystery. By the way, Ukraine is not a walkover. 
uh, while the Russians might have 150,000 troops in Ukraine at the moment, the Ukrainians have 200,000 troops. It was a very strong part of the former Soviet Union. They have 600,000 people in reserves, that is, people who've done military service. So they're not going to be pushovers by any means. And in addition to that, they've got um, surface-to-air missiles, they've got uh, anti-tank missiles, all provided not only by themselves, of course, but by the NATO countries in large numbers. So the Russians are going to find this very heavy going. I think they might concentrate on liberating, quote unquote, the Russian speaking areas. I think they would be wise to do that because if they take the war to, uh, to other areas, to Kiev, to um, maybe the eastern, the western part of Ukraine, which borders Poland, I think they will be bogged down for a very, very long time. Let's remember that for the Americans and for the NATO, the longer this war goes on, the better it is for them. And the shorter it is, shorter it is, sh shorter it can, the more quickly it can come to a conclusion, the better for Russia. But at the moment, it looks like a very long haul indeed. Yeah. Uh, so again, I'm going to ask a multi-layered question because that's what moderators do. So uh, two things. One is exactly that, that how, do you, how long do you think this war is going to go on? Because in terms of human cost, it's already been fairly significant. And uh, from what you are saying, it does look like it is going to be longer than we originally thought. I will add the corollary is that India's role is pretty interesting in this. Uh, I just happened to spend some time with a US diplomat last week. And he was very a practicing diplomat now. And he was unequivocal about where the West, dis, or US displeasure with India, saying, uh, you know, it's not uh, strong against uh, sanctions on Russia. This diplomatic position is unclear. And there is, uh, I mean, so the first world would like the India to be a much stronger uh, uh, sort of, uh, had a stronger stance against the Russian invasion. And uh, the, the contrary, the contrarian point of view to that is that India can't afford to do that diplomatically because India needs Russia as some sort of an ally. Uh, we have a fairly unfortunate set of neighbors without going into names. So India cannot really afford to be strongly in one camp or the other. It's the other view. So, Nicola, I will ask you two things. Okay. One is, how long do you think the war is going to go on, and uh, realistically? And what do you think India should do? I think the war will last uh, 12 years and three months. <laughs> and maybe one or two weeks, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, uh, but as Christian said, if the war uh, keep going forever, then Russia will, will lose so much uh, weapons and men that will uh, get weaker and weaker. I, uh, I heard that already more people died in, w among the Russian army in that war than during the Afghan war. Uh, so it's bad for them. They, I think they thought they will take Ukraine in one week to do like a big blitzkrieg and surrender the country from everywhere and just march in the cities and take them in, in no time. But probably Putin had a wrong information or people surrounding him wouldn't want to give him like a, Pessimist information, maybe it was felt false information, or maybe he really thought that Ukrainian was not a country and it was just people who wanted to be Russian again. I don't know what happened in his mind. And second question, what is, uh, if the war... Uh, what do you think in India should do? I think India should, uh, well, do nothing at the moment. So if war keeps going in Europe, I will stay here myself. So I need a neutral place to hide. Um, no, actually, it's very bizarre, like the relation with India and the first world, as you said. Uh, first, like the West wanted India to be his friends in case of a war with China, we need India in our side. Another other wars with Russia and we need India in our side and we are always deciding for you. <laughs> but so, for the moment, I don't know, just don't get involved. But 
or maybe so it's doing the right thing basically yeah now well, okay. christian what do you think uh, well i think that the uh, war uh, suits uh, the west uh, it's given a completely new lease of life to mr biden who was on the rocks in the united states it's similarly done wonders for mr macron who's coming to an election this year it's done more than wonders for mr boris johnson who was just about to lose his job in britain so a lot of people are benefiting from this and um, uh, mr putin's situation however is much more difficult <laughs> but uh, the short point is i think this war is going to continue as long as the united states wants it to do i think this is the short point and we shouldn't delude ourselves that there's going to be some magic solution found between Kiev and uh, and Moscow because Mr Zelensky who's the president of Ukraine is not going to be able to make a agreement with Russia without uh, Washington's say so now the longer the war lasted um, when the Russians were in Afghanistan if you turn the coin to the other side it was exactly the same the longer the Russians were there the better the Americans liked it because uh, it was draining the russians the ussr at that time of all the um, assets and that led of course to the break up of the ussr eventually now the same thing in russia uh, in ukraine that the longer it lasts the more the russians are going to bleed and this suits the west down to the ground mm -hmm. when they have bled enough then i think the west will call a halt to the war using zelensky and his uh, good offices to find an agreement how that agreement will turn out to be that remains the question mr zelensky seems to be quite ready to compromise on certain issues like crimea and donbass let's see whether he's allowed to do that the other question was regarding india's position uh, having been in the head of the uh, indian foreign office myself it's very fashionable now to criticize whatever the uh, indians are doing i totally disagree with the american gentleman that you talk to i must say i'd like to meet this gentleman myself they're always telling us what our national interest is we know what our national interest is thank you very much and we also know very i feel strongly about this so sorry but you know i mean they always there's a, a lady who well let's call her by her name victoria nuland who came to uh, delhi a few months ago and they said it's in your interest not to buy the missile defense system from russia i mean that is to my mind totally preposterous and she should have been asked to take the next flight out because it is not for anybody to tell us what to buy or what our national interest is this is entirely for us to decide now i think that in this case the indian government has done well i mean they've been in a cleft stick that is they've been in a dilemma but they've done the best they can you know the dice has been thrown up in the air by mr putin we we don't know how it's going to fall whether it's going to benefit uh, uh, russia very unlikely whether it's going to benefit china whether it's actually eventually going to benefit the west because prices are going to go up prices are going to go up everywhere including the west the west is going to have energy problems everybody knows that and uh, you know i think that you've got the situation where no one comes out of this very well as far as india is concerned it's a wonderful thing to be friendly with everybody and hostile to nobody but you know it's very difficult to keep that position so far we've kept it i mean the americans may criticize us but you know we're much more important to the united states at the moment than they think because we are a major democracy in a very good geophysical position in asia and they cannot do without us they can talk about uh, the quad and all that you know that four nation group but look at the other two they are japan and australia well japan's a country of 100 million australia maybe 20 million i mean when you got india on your side you're a weighty country so india has clout it has leverage and there's no point whatsoever in giving that up till we see exactly what the situation is going to look like right so you touched upon the issue of sanctions and uh, and i would like to delve a little bit into that this sanctions is is a two way street actually uh, i mean it makes all the the gentlemen you mentioned look good 
and but it's also affecting <laughs> the prices it's making it's going to increasingly make lives of common people difficult with price rises uh, it's it's a long term ramifications of economic sanctions almost on everyone so um, what do you what do you speak about say uh, about that i don't think uh, in russia the population of course is suffering a lot on uh, but i think the sanction also wanted to target the oligarchs or the people around putin we, who become rich because of him. Maybe there's like 100 people that are very rich and they pledge allegiance to Putin. But if the West succeeds to remove their assets, their property, their money, I don't know how they will do that, but if they succeed, maybe they will turn against Putin. I think that's one of the scenarios they have in mind with sanction. But I don't see how that, I don't know if it will happen like this. And also, because of this war, there is a shortage of uh, wheat and crops a bit everywhere. Like uh, other countries are suffering, like um, Egypt uh, imports 80% uh, of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia, I think. And also now, there is, uh, it's time for growing the crops in the field, and Ukrainian farmers cannot go to the field to grow um, wheat and crops. So next year, there will be an uh, even worse crisis. So that's an uh, indirect uh, effect of the sanction on the war. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you have a strong point of view on this. Yes, uh, uh, sanctions are a very blunt instrument. Uh, uh, sanctions are used uh, completely promiscuously by the West, particularly the United States. If you look at uh, the website of sanctions, you'll find six, 35 or so countries and entities uh, which are sanction, under sanctions. That's about uh, one-fifth of the world at the moment is under sanctions of some kind or another by the United States. Now, uh, the list is really endless. It goes right from, um, uh, from Venezuela through uh, to Iran, through to North Korea, and so on. You know, dozens of countries now are suffering from sanctions directly and everybody in the world is suffering from sanctions indirectly. Now, I, I think that uh, the price rise was mentioned by Oroma. Yes, we're all going to feel it, and very soon. Probably we feel it already in the petrol stations. And the food prices are likely to go up all over the world because uh, of uh, the food drain products from uh, the uh, Russians and the Ukrainians. And all other products across the board are affected by petrol price rises. Now, the point is that is, is one country or a small group of countries, and this is a 10% of the world's population, inflicting these sanctions on the rest of the world? Does this make any sense at all? Is, does, is, it, is it justice and is it democracy, as they'd like to call it? Obviously not. I mean, this is absolutely outrageous behavior. So India takes the stand that um, unless sanctions are authorized by the UN Security Council, they are not legal. The problem is that um, although we may consider them not legal, we're also placed in a lot of difficulties with payments. If you want to buy Iranian oil, you've got a problem how to make payments. And the whole um, the Russian financial system now is blocked because they've blocked the um, interbank transfers and the ruble has crashed. That's the currency of Russia. And uh, I think it's going to pr prove enormously difficult for countries like India, which import raw materials from Russia, apart from the you know, military equipment that everybody knows about, we have very strong connections with Russia in terms of energy, that is oil and gas. The space, the, our space program couldn't have started without Russia. And as you probably know, nuclear energy, because most of our nuclear power plants, are the functioning ones, are from Russia. So you know, it's not easy for us to turn off the tap in these things. And the Russians will not supply things without getting paid. So we're in a huge dilemma. What I'd like to see, Paroma, is what I, you know, I would, <laughs> I would, if I was in Delhi, like to see. I would like to see India take the lead with some of the other countries that are affected by sanctions. And nearly the whole world is affected by sanctions, except those small 10% um, of the country, of people who live in the West. 
I would like to see a concerted move to, to, to make these sanctions illegal. I think that it's necessary for us to get together in the, uh, in the United Nations, in the General Assembly, move some resolutions against countries, we don't have to name them, who are imposing sanctions on the rest of the world without their consent. If we consent to the sanctions, that's okay. But if these sanctions are introduced without our agreement, I think it's absolutely not okay, and it's time for countries like India to uh, make a stand against them. That yeah. is good. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I would just yeah. have the privilege of asking the last question as the moderator, then we'll open it up. And uh, Just to kind of have a yes, word about uh, the sure. West. The West is not always unified to impose sanctions. Like, for instance, in Iran, uh, France and Germany, after the agreement on uh, atom, uh, atomic agreement, uh, a lot of Western and uh, European nations wanted to invest in Iran. And when Trump withdrew, he asked the Europeans to withdraw from Iran, and they didn't want to. So sometimes it's not always uh, one voice, you know. That, that may well be true, Nicola, yeah. but uh, uh, France uh, was one of those countries in the, in the Security Council that was negotiating with Iran. When Mr. Trump unilaterally uh, cancelled the agreement with Iran, I know that the countries like yours was unhappy, but you didn't say anything publicly. This, this agreement had been authorized by the UN Security Council when the Americans unilaterally cancelled it. But it would be nice for um, France, UK, Germany to have said publicly that we don't support this. We, we, we think this is absolutely wrong. Yeah. So yeah. war usually is costly in, in every sense of the term, particularly uh, the human cost of war, as I say. Sometimes it does have a positive ripple in terms of the literature it produces uh, the, the art it produces, the films, is some of the biggest and la most appreciated works will not happen if there was no tragedy like war behind it. We can name many, many things. So I would really like to ask Nicola that, that you are a graphic novelist and a cartoonist. Something like this, do you think it in, a, in some kind of a way gives impetus to literature and creative activities like art? Uh, I, I don't. Good question. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes when you tell stories, um, I always go to places where bad things happen because that's where you find like uh, the most interesting stories and about uh, how people react, how they fight, how they resist. And so there is always a yeah an attraction to those places. Um, I'm not sure I understand your, the whole question. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, it, it's just, I'm just curious. Sometimes, I mean, does it create a positive ripple for, for creativity? Yes, Though, I, I yeah? can answer that in one word, Guernica. Exactly, exactly. That's what I'm trying to, trying to say. And there are many other things, like sports people not getting to play in the tournaments, uh, artists not being able to exhibit or perform. I mean, to me, all this is human cost of war. So no matter what we might say about the political and the military aspect, it touches on uh, civilian lives uh, in many, many ways, some very direct ways and some in not so direct ways, but it's avoidable at all costs. So with that, uh, I would like to have lots of hands, that's great. We don't, can't take very many, but we can certainly take a, uh, these two ladies. Uh, she, she raised the question, the girl uh, in, yeah, yeah, this one. Uh, Hello, uh, good evening panel. It was such a nice discussion. Uh, I wanted to know why this is not a continuation, oh, while this is not World War Three, it's definitely some sort of a continuation of the Cold War so as to speak. But while the previous Cold War was going on, we didn't have a superpower that is China now. So when Putin did unleash this war, even in the instance where he would win, he would not be established as a superpower because there was, there is another superpower currently in existence. So I wanted to know what kind of future did he envision in the, uh, in the prospect that he did win because Donbass or any such thing is a very small, win 
to have for such a huge war that he unleashed. So to the panel, if... Would you like to take it? Yeah. Well, um, you know, you're, you're trying to examine Mr. Putin's uh, psychology. Now, people have been trying to do that since 2000. And uh, the best minds in the world have been working on this without any success whatsoever. So far be it from me to enter this field. But I think that, you know, um, I, I think there's some rationale in what the Russians are doing. It's not completely off the wall. I think, I think I probably indicated some points earlier today that where there is some reason for them to, uh, to have intervened. The, the degree of intervention puzzles me. If they had stuck to the language-speaking part, Russian language-speaking part of Ukraine, like Crimea, I think the world would more or less have swallowed it. It may have taken some time, but they would have swallowed it. This has become a much wider conflagration. So if you ask me what was Mr. Putin's motivation for this, it's very hard, very hard for, for me to give you an answer, except that I have to say that uh, I think he'll pay a very, very bitter price for this because uh, the people of Russia, 180 million of them, are going to really suffer. I think that, I, I mean, if you were a, a, a sportswoman of your age, let us say an ice skater or whatever, you know, you have no future. I, I mean, th th where are you going to compete? Who, who are you going to compete with? You won't get a visa anywhere. Airlines won't fly. So it's a dreadful future he has uh, perpetrated on his people. And we just have to see how this ends. Yeah. Uh, we had a hand at the back. Yes, that gentleman? Yeah. Uh, this one, yes, yes. Uh, actually, the other one, uh, please. First, he raised his hand first. Then quickly, you, go, yeah. you both can ask questions, one after the other. Uh, my question goes to uh, Mr. Krishnan. Is Russia getting any benefit, economic benefit, from this war? And uh, sir, if you could also ask your question, they can take, yes. My uh, name's Shankar Nair. The, uh, quest, it's not a question, it's off the cuff uh, comment. Now, uh, what happened with uh, Putin is that he got carried away by the success in Crimea. It was a uh, stroll in the park for him uh, without any resistance from the um, rivals, i.e. NATO and uh, the sort of. Now, the point is, uh, one shouldn't be surprised that uh, the inevitable fate uh, befalling uh, Putin, it's because uh, uh, they're bo uh, born of uh, swagger and overconfidence. And um, number two, the uh, fa failure was uh, associated with... Uh, mm, Sir, we that? have to stop Waterloo. you because yes. this is, this is a platform for questions. People want to ask questions. You've made your point. I'm not, so go I'm not going to uh, take the whole evening. So what I'm saying is that... Brief, uh, brief. yes. Yeah. What I'm saying is that uh, till uh, a fail, uh, what's that? Waterloo was the failure, uh, the metaphor for failure. Now, after the war, another two countries uh, will uh, be joining it. One is, um, uh, Mal uh, what's that? The port and the uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Kiev. Will you take the question, please? Yeah. Uh, I think there's another yeah. point we haven't talked is what if uh, Donald Trump is re-elected in two years in America? Maybe it will change the whole game as well. That doesn't answer any question. <laughs> so about the, the benefit of the economy, I think Krishnan would know better than me. Well, as, you know, as far as the first gentleman is concerned, I can't see it. I mean, I know that the Russians have enormous capacity for suffering. I mean, they, they can take, uh, uh, you know, pain like no other country can. So maybe they'll be able to get through it somehow. But economic benefits, I can't see that at all. So I think that they're in for a very long period of pain. As far as the other gentleman is concerned, I think I have some sympathy with this view because Crimea was, A, enormously popular 
in uh, Russia. It boosted Mr. Putin's um, uh, standards or uh, <laughs> what do you call it? Uh, he boosted his popularity enormously. Uh, but, you know, and there was a certain amount of double speak in the West as well, because they have used the same argument of the wishes of the people in many, many contexts. Uh, take Gibraltar, for example. It's a part of Spain. But because the wishes of the people there are considered to be uh, pro-British, they want to be British, so Britain has hung, clung on to Gibraltar. There are many other examples in the world also. So Crimea may have been one of the reasons. He may have thought that he'd, his army would have been welcomed into uh, Ukraine because of so many Russian-speaking people there. It hasn't turned out to be the case. So he's miscalculated. And I think that all politicians um, who come to the top have to be accountable for their mistakes. And I think that the future of Mr. Putin, to me anyway, to my mind, is very bleak. Uh, we have time for one last question. She's been trying to ask for a long time. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, panel, for this wonderful session. My question is, uh, we've been seeing, uh, like today in the newspaper I read, the Australian High Commissioner putting out the view that he understands India's viewpoint uh, because of a northern uh, border enemies. And, but we have America on the other side saying that India has a shaky stand. Uh, at the same time, we also see Western powers who were Western states who are importing energy from energy fuel and gas from the uh, from Russia, Russia. They are willing to pay in rubles, and we are also seeing at the same time China uh, uh, with with Russia being kicked out of SWIFT. China and Russia collaborating on their own, uh, you know, way of going about the entire payment system. Uh, we also see the growth of de-dollarization going on. So what kind of, what kind of, uh, what do we see the economy of America being affected somehow? Uh, let's just move away from, the, from Russia. But do we see any way that America might be impacted? Because we also see the dragon uh, rising now. So, Nikola, to you. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, I, don't, the, I don't know. Um, but I think if Russia is losing too much uh, money in this war and too much of, if its economy is uh, crumbling, they will be more and more dependent from China. So there's a risk that uh, uh, Russia will just become a very close, even a closer ally to China and it will be absorbed. Maybe even who knows if uh, some of Siberia would not be annexed by China in the future. It could happen as well. About the economy of America, uh, I think they are still doing good so far. But I know in Europe the price of the price are rising up, so I, I don't see. I, I don't know. Would you like to add anything? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a very do sit down. I think that's a very important uh, point you mentioned. You know, you've got uh, weaponization of the sanctions by the West, led by the United States. Sometimes the sanctions, as uh, Nicola said, sometimes they're imposed only by the USA and not with the Europeans. But the latest ones on Russia have been the entire Western group. So you've got the weaponization of sanctions, and now you've got weaponization of the monetary system. Now, I think that's a very serious uh, problem, including for India. I mean, we have, uh, as you probably know from every day's papers, we have about $600 billion of reserves. Where do you think those reserves are? Under somebody's pillow in the Reserve Bank? Well, they're not. And China has $3 trillion of reserves. So where do you think those reserves are? Now, you know, the, basically, uh, the, uh, these holdings of exchange, of, um, of monetary power, go to the places which are safest and where exchange can be done immediately with a click of the computer, where you can move money around easily. Now, by and large, those reserves are in the United States. Now, if the United States chokes off your access to those uh, reserves, your own money, then you've got serious problems. And I think that this is where uh, I think the whole world is very uneasy now, because even if you want to buy um, Russian gas, Russian oil, 
how do you pay? Because you want to draw some reserves from, let's say, uh, the banks in uh, USA to make the transfer. They won't do it at the moment. That SWIFT system, as it's called, is blocked. So I think that this is another issue, like sanctions, where the world has to come together, the rest of the world, and think of how to get around this problem. The only difficulty is that whoever takes the lead in this, and as you, I think, correctly said, China and Russia particularly, some other countries are interested in moving away from the dollar-denominated trade, it's going to take a very long time, very long time, probably not in our lifetimes. So it's, uh, it's a system that's been created since the, between the First War and the Second World War, and it's not going to be changed in a hurry. Uh, with that, we absolutely must end this session. Uh, thank you to my great panelists uh, for what turned out to be a very engaging discussion. Uh, as, like most of you, I'm not a fan of war. So my wish would be that in the next KLM, uh, we shouldn't have a session like this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Srinivasan, Nicola, and Poroma. Uh, our authors' books are available at the bookstore outside. You can chat with them and uh, get your books signed by them. Uh, it's just outside the East Gate. Our next session is titled Culture Club, where